bless your name, Lord. Just say his name with me. Jesus. Jesus. We give you all we have today. We worship and praise before you. We thank you for your presence with us, Lord, because you said that when we're gathered in your name, you are there. You are here right now. And Father, I pray that with your power and your presence, just as you've confirmed your presence among us through Holy Communion, confirm your presence among us through the Word of God. So that, Father, we might be in position to receive every good thing you have promised us in these days. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to two or three people and just say, it sure is good to know Jesus. Well, good morning, Abundant Life. How are you? It is good to have you here in the house of the Lord this morning. We want to take a minute to greet those that are joining us online, folks from all over, not only in New York City, New York State, but also uh, Michigan, Connecticut, Tennessee, Georgia, Texas, Florida, Arizona, other places around the country and the world. God bless you and welcome. Let's give a big shout out to all of our online attenders today that are with us. Praise God. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Well, how many of you brought your Bible with you this morning? Let's quickly just take our Bibles up and hold them up before the Lord and thank Him for the gift of His Word. Just say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You that it is alive, it is powerful, and it instructs me in how I should live. Anoint me today to receive Your words so that I might act on them and be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. God is good. Well, over the last, uh, last few weeks, we've been teaching on what it means to be a true disciple. And a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about the fact that a true disciple is committed to the Word of God, is committed to the house of the Lord, the church of God, and is committed to acting on the Word of God in whatever He calls us to do. And then last week, we began looking, actually two weeks ago, we started talking about the fact that a true disciple, someone who is really following Jesus, is a steward. They recognize that everything they have, everything they own, comes from God. Turn to somebody and say, God made it all. God owns it all. But God gave it to us to manage. So we are managers of his stuff, not owners of our stuff. And that's really a different way to think when you live in the United States of America. Because we focus on our stuff, accumulating our stuff, getting stuff, protecting our stuff, securing our stuff, trying to increase our stuff, and there's nothing wrong with having a good relationship with the material things of this world. But folks, it's so easy for us to become things focused, to become financially and money focused and materialistic. And how many of you know we're probably the most materialistic generation of any group of people that have ever lived on the face of the earth, if you know anything about history, right? And, and so as good as it is to receive the blessings of the Lord, the material blessings of the Lord that he's given us, we are not owners of them, we are stewards of them. And God has called us to steward them well. Now, it's very clear that we're living in a period of time that's preceding a prophecy that God has given throughout the scripture that someday Jesus is going to return. In fact, there's no prophecy in the New Testament that's repeated more often in the books of the New Testament than the promise that Jesus is going to come back to the earth, physically, visibly, and really. Amen. And we believe that. And Christians from the first century have lived in anticipation of that day. And the Bible tells us, we studied it a couple of weeks ago in Luke 19, that while Jesus is in heaven in a far country, receiving his kingdom, that he gave us the things we have to manage until he returns. And it's our responsibility to manage them well. And I'm going to share this with you. This is important. There is no reason for 
God's followers, God's children, to lack what they need to do what God's called us to do in the life we have today. Now, there may be a lot of natural economic reasons why we may be struggling or suffering, but the truth is God has promised that he will give us what we need to accomplish what he's called us to do. And that isn't just to what he's accomplished to call us to do in terms of preaching and sharing the gospel, but in terms of living our lives, being uh, having, having families, raising kids, living this life and enjoying the good things that God provides. And so God wants us to have the right attitude towards stuff so that he can channel stuff to us and through us to finish the work he's called us to do before Jesus returns. And I want you to know Jesus is coming back and he's coming back soon. Amen. Now, in Luke 19, the Bible says that when the Lord returns, he's going to call his people together and ask us to give an account for what we did with his stuff that he gave us while he was away. That means every one of us who are believers are going to give an account to Jesus for what we did with our lives, with our relationships, what we did with our time, what we did with the gifts he gave us, and what we did with the money and the stuff that he gave us. And I want you to have a good conversation when you see Jesus. I want you to be able to say to the Lord, Father, I studied your word. I learned what your word says about managing my things. And Lord, I'm practicing those things. And Father, I want to I want to just let you know, I learned that my money was not mine. It was yours. And I used it for purposes that glorified you. And the Bible says when the Lord returns, he won't just <clears throat> commend us for having been good stewards of the things he gave us, but he will also reward us. And this is the thing you need to realize. God never asks us to do something in terms of obedience that isn't connected to a promise because God always blesses obedience. And when you and I are obedient with our material things, we will be blessed. It doesn't mean that we're going to immediately experience every blessing that we need. But over time and in eternity, we will never regret the things we did with our stuff as it relates to managing it for the glory and honor of God. Amen. So what you do with your stuff, what you do with your money is a spiritual thing. There's no mistake that out of the 40 some odd parables that Jesus told, 23 of them had to do with resources, assets, money, and material things. And the reason that Jesus talked so much about it is because he said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. And so if you're really a disciple following Jesus, we'll be able to take a look at your bank account and your spending history, and it will reveal that Christ is in your life. That means the places that your resources flow to are certainly meeting your needs, your obligations, enjoying the good things of God, but it will reflect your honor of God and your giving to others. And the Bible commands us over and over again to be generous people. Amen. So God wants to bless us. In fact, every time the Lord tells us to give in the Old and the New Testament, he always, he always uh, packs the commandment to give with a promise to bless. It's interesting. Now, we shouldn't just be giving because we're trying to get something, like we're going to the lot, you know, playing the lottery, or, or you know, we're not just giving to, so that we can get something back. We're giving to honor God to be stewards. But God has promised, if we're obedient with our giving, with our tithes and offerings, that he will respond by providing for us. And to not emphasize the second part of that, the promise, is to miss. If we just focus on the obedience, we'll become legalistic. But if we recognize that the obedience is connected to a promise, then the obedience doesn't become a grudging obligation. It becomes a joyful opportunity to participate in the blessing of the Lord. Turn to somebody and say, God has a system to manage money that he promises to bless. Now, if that is true, and we're going to see today that it is true, then it's important for us to enjoy the promise, believe for the promise, but not neglect the obedience. As you've heard me say before, you can't uh, choose what's behind door number one. You can't get what's behind door number one if you choose door number two. In other words, you've got to make the choice that's connected with the obedience. But when you do over time, the blessing always comes. Turn to somebody and say, the blessing always comes when I obey the Lord. 
every single time. Now, we're going to take a look at another widow. Last week, our guest Chad talked to us about stewardship, and he used the story of Elisha and the widow who God gave a strategy. She was in a desperate condition. He gave her a strategy uh, to build a business and to multiply her, her wealth as she was obedient to the commandment of the Lord. But I want to share with you another story, another story from the story of Elijah that preceded the story that we heard about last week. So I want you to open up to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. And today we're going to learn a very important principle. In fact, you can have your budget in place. You can have all of your, uh, you know, be saving this and putting aside that and paying this and paying this off and all of that. But if you neglect this part of God's commandment regarding finances, you're not going to experience the full blessing of the Lord. And I want you to. I said, I want you to. I'm preaching this for you. So let's take a look at the principle. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 8 says this. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, and this is Elijah, arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now what you need to know in context is that the land was in a famine, a drought, because the people had been disobedient to the word of the Lord, God commanded Elijah to prophesy a drought. And there was a drought for three years. And you have three years of a drought in a, in a world that is built on an agrarian culture and is built on crops. You're going to have tremendous famine and poverty. And that was the condition. And here's what's interesting. Elijah prophesied the drought and the drought came. Everybody was feeling it. It wasn't just a recession. It was a depression. And yet God had provision for Elijah. I want you to know this. No matter what kind of season you're in, if you're in a drought season or a tight season, or if the economy was to shift and things were to become difficult more than they are now, I want you to know something. God always provides for his people. If we'll follow him, he'll tell us where to go for the provision that he will provide. He said, go to Zarephath, and there's a widow that I've commanded to take care of you. Everybody say, he's commanded. See, the Lord commands the earth to bless the people of God when they're obedient to go where he tells them to go. Verse 10, so he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and he said, please bring me a little water in my cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Not just give me some water, but give me a little something to eat. And so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have bread. Only a handful of flour in a small bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. That's how serious it was. It was her, her last meal. She literally was preparing for her last meal. Now, I just want you to take a moment and feel compassion for this woman. I want you to imagine what it would be like for this woman to have lost her husband in the middle of a famine. She has a little boy. She's already gaunt because there hasn't been food or water. And so the little bit that she has is very, very precious very precious. In fact, it's so precious that she recognizes she only has enough to make one little cake of bread that she can split with her son, and they'll eat that as their final meal. And then she expected that she would die. Think about how serious her financial, physical, and economic condition was at this moment. Now, I want you to think about that and feel compassion for that woman. And I want you to think about people today that are in our world that maybe are in a very similar situation. We don't see that much in America, but the reality is there are millions of people in parts of the world where there is famine and drought right now. There are babies who are suffering, who if they don't get nutrition, they will die. There are villages and parts of the world where if they don't have good water, their, their families will perish and die. And I think one of the great blessings that we've been able to experience in the modern world is we have the technology to create crops in large numbers and distribute them. And I think we need to do a better job at making sure that gets to everyone who needs it. 
But I want you to notice that it's difficult and as challenging as this woman was, what would you ask that woman to do? I mean, would you, you would just say, listen, don't worry about getting me water. Don't worry about, listen, just you go ahead and take care of your stuff. God's going to provide. But that's not what Elijah said. In fact, if we were to hear a preacher say this today to someone, we would basically uh, put him, blow him up on YouTube and Instagram. And uh, we would say, this guy is terrible. He's telling this poor woman to do something for him. But there's a strategy in the wisdom of God in this. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Notice he had to deal with her fear. When you are in a financial difficulty or a tight spot, or you don't feel like you have enough to make what you have stretch to meet the needs that you have in life, fear is a constant companion. There's always a sense of dread, of anxiety. What if my car breaks down? What if I can't pay off this bill? What if I lose my job? What's going to happen? How am I going to meet this need? Fear is a present companion of those who are in a desperate financial condition. And I want you to know something. Fear is real. I don't want to dismiss it. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to walk in the blessing of God, you're going to have to deal with fear. And one of the reasons people don't give generously to God and give tithes is because they're afraid. It's not because they don't love God. It's not because necessarily they're greedy. It's just because they look at the math and they look at their reality and they say, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And that fear is real. But if you and I are going to be people of faith, we're going to have to look at the natural. We're going to have to look at that fear and do what's right anyway. In fact, the greatest blessings of the Lord come when we do the right thing when we're scared to do it. The definition of courage is doing something you're afraid to do. A courageous person isn't somebody who boldly goes to do something that isn't frightening. We call them courageous because they face their fear. The, the champions who went into the Twin Towers on 9-11, those fire department workers, those police officers who literally gave their lives, they knew they were going into certain danger and possible death, but they did it anyway. That's a, that's a hero. That's courage. And sometimes when you have nothing but need in your life and you turn to God for help, God asks you to do something with the little that you have. Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. Go ahead and make this last meal. But make me a small cake from it first. Maybe she had enough for a loaf of bread, but before you make your final meal, Take a little bit away from what you've got and make a tiny cake for me first and bring it to me and afterwards make some for yourself and your son. Now, I want you to notice the language here. He said, make a small cake for me first and afterwards address your physical need. Isn't that interesting? Now, was Elijah trying to punish her? Was Elijah trying to, uh, trying to just get something for himself because he didn't care for her? Elijah knew the principle of putting God first with your stuff. He said, well, this isn't money. This is oil and flour. You have to understand something. In the ancient world, people didn't have monetary instruments as we do today. There was some of that. The wealthy had some of that. But most people traded in material things, goats, sheep, crops, flour, oil. These were valuable quantities. And you would trade for what you needed. And so this was her last bit. And he said, I'm not asking you to give it all to me. He could have. He said, just before. This is so key. He didn't say, make yourself a cake and then make me another one at the same time. He said, before you even try to make a cake for your son, make one for me. It doesn't have to be big, just a small one. Take something of what you have and notice this word, first. Everybody say it with me, first. God wants you to put him first. First and he deserves it. When Jesus died on the cross, he put you first. 
and disciples put God first. They don't pay their bills, eat at the restaurant, and see what's left over when they go to church. They don't wait to see how they feel if they're generous that day. They develop an internal principle that when it comes to everything I have, even the little I have, God gets his first. Now, it's interesting when we talk about giving tithes and first fruits, which we will talk about today. Uh, it's interesting that, you know, God himself, it's not like he reaches down from heaven and takes the money or takes the offering himself, right? I mean, he doesn't need anything. It's not like we give it to him directly, but there's a principle here. When we give to someone or to a ministry that represents him, we're giving to God. By giving to Elijah, who was the voice of God, the prophet of God in the day, God took it personally. Jesus told the disciples, in as much as you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. What you do for God's people, God will do for you. God considers your giving to his work a personal gift to him. So he gave her the challenge. Make a small cake for me first. And bring it to me, and afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. This was really important. She wasn't to make two cakes at the same time. She was to make the first cake, bring it to him, then go back and make the second cake. Very important you see the strategy. Verse 14, here's the promise. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. That means if you obey God first, he's going to stretch what you have left and you will never go hungry until the famine ends. You see, the promise is what she had to cling to. Remember, she was afraid. The promise, see, when you're afraid, you've got to have something that you can anchor on to be courageous. And the thing that we act on is not checking our balances to see what we have. It's not checking what we were going to do, the concerts we were going to go see or the, the things we were going to purchase. Or the, you know, it's not looking at what we want and then saying, well, what do we have left for God? It's saying, I'm going to give to God first and I'm going to honor him first. And I'm going to trust him that he's going to spread the rest. He's going to cover the rest. So... It says, thus said the Lord, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry until the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word. Now, it's the word of Elijah, but it was the word of God. Everybody say, she did according to the word. Hear me on this. You cannot claim the blessings that God's God's word promises if you're not willing to do the things that are connected to the blessings that God's word commands. You've got to act on the word to receive the blessing. James in chapter 1 of James said it this way, but be a doer and actor on the word and not a hearer only, thus deceiving yourself. For he who acts on the word is blessed in what he does. The blessing comes when you act on the word. And so she did. The Bible says she did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. And the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. This principle taught in in this passage is not just taught here. It's taught throughout the word of God. God wants the first. Turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis. I want you to see something. One of the earliest stories we see in Genesis is the story of Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. And in Genesis chapter 4, the Bible tells us that even in this very nascent stage of human development, There was a revelation of God's existence and that the people, and there was just a small family, the people knew, Adam, Eve, and their children, that they needed to give of the material blessings they had to the Lord. The idea of offering was present in the first family. Let's take a look. 
Genesis 4 and verse 1. Now Adam <clears throat> knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I've acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, and this time she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the first of the ground to the Lord. Notice the word first. This is the key. Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and of uh, their fat. And the Lord respected Abel, I'm sorry, not the first offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, everybody say do well. In other words, do something different that's better than what you did. If you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, if you do the right thing, you're going to receive the blessing. Now, what's interesting about Cain and Abel's offerings are both of them brought according to their business, what they had. Cain, at that time, he was a farmer. So he had, uh, he had the flocks, or he, I'm sorry, he had the crops. He was growing crops. Abel was raising animals. And so he had sheep. Now, it's not, the important thing is not what your job is. The important thing is that when you come to bring to the Lord, you need to do it in the way that God commands. Now, if you look carefully at these two stories, you're going to see that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. He brought an offering from what he had. And you would think, well, that was good. That's enough. But evidently, it was not enough. Abel brought an offering too. The only thing that separated Abel's offering from Cain's offering was that Abel brought of the firstling. In other words, his was the first, the firstborn, the first that came in. The first increase, you've got to realize in the ancient world, whenever your farm animals had a litter or had, had, had little animals, that was a prosperous moment. That was like when a farmer's crops comes in in the fall, their prosperity comes in. Animals were valuable. And so Abel took of his first and gave it to the Lord. Cain brought an offering, but it wasn't first. And God didn't respect Cain as he did Abel. Now, this is fascinating. The only thing that really separates these two, they both brought from their businesses or what they did with their hands, but only the one that brought the firstling was fully accepted. This tells us once again that God wants you to put him first with whatever you have. When something comes in, you honor him first. I want you to look at the book of Proverbs. Look at the book of Proverbs. Chapter 3, when we talk about tithes, <clears throat> people get hung up on 10%. And I understand that, that it can sometimes be a challenge <clears throat> for people. But I want you to notice, I'm going to say this to you. I believe in the tithe. I believe that God deserves the tithe and over and above the tithe. But the biggest principle isn't the percentage, it's the priority. God wants to be first and deserves to be first. Notice in Proverbs 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your possessions. This Hebrew word translated possessions means wealth or money. It's talking about your income, specifically what comes into you. He said, honor the Lord with your wealth or possessions. Notice he's going to expand on that with the, say it out loud, with a what? First fruits of all your increase. We could say income. If you work and you produce something, the first should be given to God. And notice, when we give to God with our stuff, it honors him. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth. How are you going to honor God with your money? When you take the first and you give it to him. He said, the first fruits of all your increase. But notice, if he just put a period there, we should obey God and give God our first fruits. But I want you to notice there's a promise connected to this. Just like with the widow who was asked to give her last, out of her last meal, a little bit to the Lord first by giving to the prophet. 
In the same way, God is saying to his people here, if you will honor the Lord, if you'll honor me by giving the first fruits of your increase, what is the result? Please read with me verse 10. So your what? Barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now these were farmers, remember. So barns represented their banks. That's where their harvest came in and was stored. Their vats is for those who were vintners who were raising grapes and, and producing wine. He said that you will have full barns and fat vats. Turn to somebody and say, I want some fat vats and full barns. Just tell them. <laughs> I want some full barns. Don't you want some full barns? I want some investments that are full, that are growing. I want you to notice it's not just about having the right financial strategy, although that's good. When you put God first, he promises to bless, now notice, the work of your hands. How did they get their barns filled? Did somebody come and just drop a bunch of crops in their barn? Was, he, was this promise mean that, that somebody would drive up in a truck and just give you a bunch of wine to sell? No. It's not, it's not that. It's your work. These were farmers will prosper. When we honor God with our tithes and the first fruits of our income, we enter into a covenant with God. And he's promised to bless the way he returns to us is through the work of our hands. And when you recognize that your daily work, no matter what it is, I don't care if you're working at a restaurant, at a drive through I don't care if you're working as a server or a waiter. I don't care if you're working in finance. I don't care if you're working as an attorney. It doesn't matter if you're working in a blue-collar job, a white-collar job, you're an entrepreneur, a business person, whatever it is. When you receive wealth or income from that, the first belongs to the Lord. And when you give him the first, you honor him, and he promises to return it to you through your business. And I'm going to tell you one of the greatest reasons that Christians today, and I'm going to say this because I know it's in, my, it's in my heart, I don't know what anybody gives personally and directly. I choose not to know that. But, and and, and I'm, our needs are met, our bills are paid. Praise the Lord. But I want to say this to you. I know this because the Spirit spoke to me. There are people who love God that are in this church that are not giving God their first fruits. You're robbing God and you're robbing yourself. He loves you. And you know, God is, he, there's a basic welfare system that God has for everyone, regardless of what they give. But I want you to know, if you want to walk into the overflow where your barns are full and your vats are overflowing, fat vats and full barns, you've got to give the Lord your first fruits. That means you've got to make him priority. In your budget, you need to sit down and say, I got paid this week, and I'm going to take the first, and I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to set it aside. I'm not going to see what's left. I'm going to give it to God. This requires a reorientation. It is better to cancel subscriptions and tithe than have all your TV options open, and you're robbing God. Have you, isn't it interesting? You might get a raise, but you still don't have enough money at the end of the month. Isn't it amazing how things just kind of keep going away? Often it's because we neglect tithing and giving to God first. Now listen, tithing, the word tithe is a word that means tenth. And God's gave us a percentage. He said, take the first tenth and return it to me by giving it to my work, to my house, and I will bless you. And I believe that that's true. And some folks today argue, well, that was for the Old Testament Jews under the law. What they failed to realize, tithing didn't begin under the law. Tithing began with the first covenant man, Abraham. He gave the first tithe in Genesis chapter 14. He came back from a defeat of the kings. And as he came back, he came through, a, a, at that time, a, a little mountain village known as Salem. Later, it would become Jerusalem the city of peace, and in the middle of this, this mountain town, in the center of the Judean wilderness, there was a king, and his name was Melchizedek, which means king of righteousness, and he was a priest of God Most High. Before there was a priesthood, before there was Aaron and Levi and God established the Jewish priesthood, there was a priest of God just sitting there in Salem waiting, waiting 
until the man with a covenant came through. Look it with me in Genesis 14. Folks, I'm not trying to take something from you. I'm trying to get something to you. I'm telling you in these last days, if you will be honor God faithfully with your tithes and offerings, I'm telling you, you will have enough. You will have more than enough. The Lord will bless you. His promises are true. They're as true today as they were then. If he promised he would bless his people of the old covenant with the tithe, through the tithe, how much more will he bless his people under the new covenant when we bring our first fruits and our tithes to the Lord? Notice it says in Genesis chapter 14, in verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God most high, and he blessed him, that's Abraham, and said, blessed be Abraham of God most high, and blessed a possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who's delivered your enemies into your hand. Abraham had just had a great battle. He had defeated his enemies, and he took the spoils of the battle, and he had a retinue. He had his servants carrying all of this wealth and blessing that he had gotten from winning the war. And he meets this priest, and this priest bless him. And I want you to notice what it says in verse at the end of verse 20. It says, and he gave him a tithe of all. The word tithe again is tenth. He gave him a tenth of all of his spoils. And the king of, uh, and now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread of the sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you say I've made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten. So he said, listen, I, I am going to give this tithe and I'm going to trust the Lord to meet every other need that I have. Now, here's what I want you to see. The 15th chapter is what happened next. Verse one, after these things, after what things? After Abraham tithed the first tithe to the first priest at the first house of God in the first occurrence in the first 12 or 14 chapters of Genesis. Long before, hundreds of years before there was a law. The father of covenant tithed. And it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, notice this phrase, do not be afraid. Notice he says the same thing to Abram that the prophet, the Lord said through the prophet to the widow Zarephath, do not fear. When you give something to God, and especially you give a tithe, there is a sense of I'm, I'm losing something. Something's leaving me. My income is being diminished. And we have to deal with that fear. We've got to recognize we're not saying goodbye when we put it in the offering or, or make the deposit online or give the offering. We are actually sowing it into an, an account that will multiply. Just say this out loud. Everything I give to God goes into an account and it does not disappear. That's right. The money may be spent by the ministry or the service or the person that needs it, but I want you to know something. God takes the equivalent of that monetary instrument in heaven. He puts it in an account that has compound interest. And so God says, don't be afraid. Notice this next phrase. I am your shield. The word shield is the one who will defend you and your exceedingly great reward. You can look this up, but in the Hebrew, the words exceedingly great mean rapidly increasing. Rapidly increasing, and the word reward is the Hebrew word for salary or wages. Basically, God said, after he tithed, don't be afraid, for I am your defender. I'm going to defend you financially, and I will be your rapidly increasing supply of wage and salary. Because you gave, I'm going to increase your wages. And he did. In the Bible, one of the next things the Bible says is that Abraham became very rich. Now listen, we're not giving to get. We give to honor God. That's what's so important. If he never gave us another thing back, it would be fine. We want to bless him because we want, to, we want his work to go forth on the earth. We want to deal with the fear in our life that keeps us from giving to God. We want to deal with the, with the materialism in our life. Tithing deals with greed. It goes right to the heart of fear. And I want to say something to the many people that tithe faithfully in this church. God bless you. And I want you to know people think, well, you know, those who have more than enough, they tithe. 
A lot of the folks that are faithful tithers are actually folks that are start out struggling on a budget and it's difficult for them. And I've noticed sometimes people who have more than enough don't tithe. Isn't that interesting? They give leftovers or special things from time to time and God receives any offering we give him, that's fine. But there's something about giving God the first and giving God the tenth that has a blessing connected to it. Amen? Amen. Now, I know this is challenging some people. I know there's folks out there that think, well, you know, you're trying to get 10% of my money. I'm not trying to get anything. I'm just saying you, you need to be a member of a local church. And whatever local church you're a member of, you need to give your first fruits to the work of the Lord in that local church because it's in your best interest to do so. Because the Lord will use your offerings to multiply you. And if you can't tithe at this church, find a church you can. Amen. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, if you'll be faithful with your first fruits and your tithes, God will bless you. Say to some, just turn to somebody and say, God will bless you. Let's take a look in Matthew 6. Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, this is the great Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave, and he spends a lot of time in the Sermon on the Mount talking about treasures and material things, particularly in chapter 6, where he talks about what we do with our stuff. He begins by saying, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, verse 19. Thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart is also. Praise the Lord. But notice down in verse 31, he's talking about the material needs of his people. He said, therefore, do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. God knows you need material things to survive and to thrive. But notice what he says in verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seeking first the kingdom of God is, yes, putting the Lord first in your prayer life, putting the Lord first in your thoughts, making sure that God and the pursuit of God and the love of God and, the, and following God is your main goal of your heart. But I want you to notice, this is really key. Part of putting God first, as we've already seen, is when we honor him with the first fruits of our increase. When you give to God off the top of what comes in, you're saying to the Lord, I recognize all I have is yours Here's my offering to you. Now bless what's left. Bless what's left, stretch it, and multiply my business and job. And watch and see what the Lord will do in your life. I'm telling you, we tithe. We believe in tithing. It's It's a principle here. We don't print tithe out of the law. We tithe out of the promise, the covenant promise of giving God first fruits. And we've always seen the Lord meet our needs. And I want to encourage you and challenge you to not only have a budget, as we learned last week, not only get your finances in order, but I'm going to say to you, give to the Lord first. And if you will make God first in your giving, you watch and see if he doesn't open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing, you won't have enough room to receive it. Amen. 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 Now, everything we've taught today is from, I haven't even gone into the law to tell you what the law says about tithing. Because I don't want you to tithe out of legalism. I want you to tithe out of covenant, out of blessing. And someone said, Pastor, I don't know. I've got so much fear. I don't know if I can can start giving a tenth. Okay, let me just say this to you. Start where your faith is. And the first thing you want to do is this. You want to take a look at every time something comes in. I'm going to say this to you, birthday gifts. I tithe off birthday gifts. If somebody gives me a personal offering, I tithe off that. But especially income from my work. That's the main thing. Any increase that comes in. I take the 10th and I give it to the Lord. And for me, I give off, I used to tithe off my net and God blessed it. And then the Lord just gave me faith to tithe off my gross and I tithe off my gross and he blesses it more. I don't think God is like, you know, in heaven with a, you know, with a ledger. Here's the key. Start where you are and start giving to God first. And I would encourage you to start with the tithe, 
And if your faith isn't there yet, start with something and work towards a tithe. But put him first. Every time you get paid, send that offering off to the local church. Send it off to the work of the Lord. Let it go and flow in the direction of God. And as you do, with your heart, say, Father, everything I have is yours. Now here, I return to you the first fruits. I give this back to you. Lord, bless now my barns and fill them up and overflow my vats. Lord, I'm trusting you with this, and I believe you're going to meet the rest of those needs. And watch and see what the Lord will do in your life. I want you to be fully blessed and fully funded. And it starts by putting God fully first in your giving. Praise the Lord. Have you been blessed by the word today? Amen. Let's all stand up and thank God for his word. Father, we thank you and praise you for the word. We thank you for the privilege of coming into this house and hearing, Father, from you. Uh, Lord, receiving the blessing of the covenant for, through Holy Communion, worshiping you. And Father, I thank you that in this house, we don't make any, uh, Lord, we're not ashamed and we don't make any excuses for what your word teaches about radical, generous giving. And I pray, Father, that this congregation would be the most radically generous congregation that has ever existed in central New York. That, Father, whether people are here that are fully funded or people are here that are struggling, that every person would put you first in their finances and that, Father, as they do, I know that you will do what you have promised. You you will fill their barns and make fat their vats, Lord. You're going to return to them many fold in the name of Jesus. And I pray for those who are faithful in their giving today that may be struggling. Maybe the enemy's coming against them. They have a need. I pray, Father, that you would look down from heaven and meet all their needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you that regardless of what happens in this world, you have promised to provide for us all that we need and more than enough to be a blessing to someone else. Lord, give us the faith to do it in Jesus' mighty name. Let's worship God and thank him right now. Praise God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise God. Last thing I would say is this. In Malachi 3, God speaks to his people and he told them to tithe and they weren't doing it. And God said, you are robbing me in tithes and offerings. You are thieves because you're not giving to me what I said to give to me. Now, here's the thing. He said, now, prove me in this. Put me to the test. Malachi 3.10. I want you to test me. This is the only place in the Bible where God says to test him. One place, Malachi 3.10. Test me in this and see. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that you won't have enough room to receive it, I will rebuke the things that devour your crops for your sakes. The stuff that's eating your wealth, I'm going to rebuke that. God is able to make that dishwasher last another three years. God, I'm telling you, God is able to stretch what's left. When you put God first, watch what happens. Test him. Not out of the law, out of covenant, out of promise, out of blessing. And see and watch the Lord meet your needs in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. We love you so much. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may something great happen in your lives this week as you seek, obey, and serve him. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you. We love you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John, for that balanced, well-understood word from the Lord. I love talking about money in church. It gets tricky. If you have questions, if you need prayer, if you need clarification, or if you want to review some of those biblical references that Pastor spoke out of today, if you're watching on our church website or on our church app, there are live hosts, there are ministers right there ready to answer your questions, ready to pull you into a private chat and pray with you if that's what you need. It won't show up to everybody else on the internet. We can respect your privacy. We want to be there for you. We love and value our online 
community. We thank you for joining us today for this word from Abundant Life with Pastor John. We love doing this with you. We can't wait for next time here at Abundant Life. For right now, we got some fall celebration. There's some donuts in the lobby. There's some apple cider. I'm saying, if you have a chance, come on out to Abundant Life in person. We love it here. Until then, we'll see you on our website. We'll see you on YouTube. We love sharing these videos with you guys. We can't wait to do it next time. We love you guys. We'll see you soon from Abundant Life.